The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, An Introduction, by Michel Foucault. Part 4. The Deployment of Sexuality. 1. Objective. Why these investigations? I am well aware that an uncertainty runs through the sketches I have drawn thus far, one that threatens to invalidate the more detailed inquiries that I have projected. I have repeatedly stressed that the history of the last centuries in Western societies did not manifest the movement of a power that was essentially repressive. I based my argument on the disqualification of that notion while feigning ignorance of the fact that a critique has been mounted from another quarter, and doubtless in a more radical fashion, a critique conducted at the level of the theory of desire. In point of fact, the assertion that sex is not repressed is not altogether new. Psychoanalysts have been saying the same thing for some time. They have challenged the simple little machinery that comes to mind when one speaks of repression. The idea of a rebellious energy that must be throttled has appeared to them inadequate for deciphering the manner in which power and desire are joined to one another. They consider them to be linked in a more complex and primary way than through the interplay of a primitive, natural and living energy welling up from below, and a higher order seeking to stand in its way. Thus, one should not think that desire is repressed for the simple reason that the law is what constitutes both desire and the lack on which it is predicated. Where there is desire, the power relation is already present. An illusion, then, to denounce this relation for a repression exerted after the event. But vanity as well, to go questing after a desire that is beyond the reach of power. But in an obstinately confused way, I sometimes spoke as though I were dealing with equivalent notions of repression and sometimes of law, of prohibition or censorship. Through stubbornness or neglect, I failed to consider everything that can distinguish their theoretical implications. And I grant that one might justifiably say to me, by constantly referring to positive technologies of power, you are playing a double game where you hope to win on all counts. You confuse your adversaries by appearing to take the weaker position, and, discussing repression alone, you would have us believe, wrongly, that you have rid yourself of the problem of law. And yet you keep the essential practical consequence of the principle of power as law, namely the fact that there is no escaping from power, that it is always already present, constituting that very thing which one attempts to counter it with. As to the idea of a power repression, you have retained its most fragile theoretical element, and this in order to criticize it. You have retained the most sterilizing political consequence of the idea of power law, but only in order to preserve it for your own use. The aim of the inquiries that will follow is to move less toward a theory of power than toward an analytics of power, that is, toward a definition of the specific domain formed by relations of power and toward a determination of the instruments that will make possible its analysis. However, it seems to me that this analytics can be constituted only if it frees itself completely from a certain representation of power that I would term, it will be seen later why, juridico-discursive. It is this conception that governs both the thematics of repression and the theory of the law as constitutive of desire. In other words, what distinguishes the analysis made in terms of the repression of instincts from that made in terms of the law of desire is clearly the way in which they each conceive of the nature and dynamics of the drives, not the way in which they conceive of power. They both rely on a common representation of power, which, depending on the use made of it and the position it is accorded with respect to desire, leads to two contrary results either to the promise of a liberation if power is seen as having only an external hold on desire, or, if it is constitutive of desire itself, to the affirmation, you are always already trapped. Moreover, one must not imagine that this representation is peculiar to those who are concerned with the problem of the relations of power with sex. In fact, it is much more general. One frequently encounters it in political analyses of power and it is deeply rooted in the history of the West. These are some of its principal features. The negative relation. It never establishes any connection between power and sex that is not negative. 
rejection, exclusion, refusal, blockage, concealment, or mask. Where sex and pleasure are concerned, power can do nothing but say no to them. What it produces, if anything, is absences and gaps. It overlooks elements, introduces discontinuities, separates what is joined, and marks off boundaries. Its effects take the general form of limit and lack. The insistence of the rule. Power is essentially what dictates its law to sex, which means, first of all, that sex is placed by power in a binary system, licit and illicit, permitted and forbidden. Secondly, power describes an order for sex that operates at the same time as a form of intelligibility. Sex is to be deciphered on the basis of its relation to the law. And finally, power acts by laying down the rule. Power's hold on sex is maintained through language, or rather through the act of discourse that creates from the very fact that it is articulated a rule of law. It speaks, and that is the rule. The pure form of power resides in the function of the legislator, and its mode of action with regard to sex is of a juridico-discursive character. The Cycle of Prohibition Thou shalt not go near, thou shalt not touch, thou shalt not consume, thou shalt not experience pleasure, thou shalt not speak, thou shalt not show thyself. Ultimately, thou shalt not exist, except in darkness and secrecy. To deal with sex, power employs nothing more than a law of prohibition. Its objective, that sex renounce itself. Its instrument, the threat of a punishment that is nothing other than the suppression of sex. Renounce yourself or suffer the penalty of being suppressed. Do not appear if you do not want to disappear. Your existence will be maintained only at the cost of your nullification. Power constrains sex only through a taboo that plays on the alternative between two non-existences. The Logic of Censorship This interdiction is thought to take three forms, affirming that such a thing is not permitted, preventing it from being said, denying that it exists. Forms that are difficult to reconcile. But it is here that one imagines a sort of logical sequence that characterizes censorship mechanisms. It links the inexistent, the illicit, and the inexpressible in such a way that each is at the same time the principle and the effect of the others. One must not talk about what is forbidden until it is annulled in reality. What is inexistent has no right to show itself, even in the order of speech where its inexistence is declared. And that which one must keep silent about is banished from reality as the thing that is tabooed above all else. The logic of power exerted on sex is the paradoxical logic of a law that might be expressed as an injunction of non-existence, non-manifestation, and silence. The Uniformity of the Apparatus Power over sex is exercised in the same way at all levels. From top to bottom, in its overall decisions and its capillary interventions alike, whatever the devices or institutions on which it relies, it acts in a uniform and comprehensive manner. It operates according to the simple and endlessly reproduced mechanism of law, taboo, and censorship. From state to family, from prince to father, from the tribunal to the small change of everyday punishments, from the agencies of social domination to the structures that constitute the subject himself, one finds a general form of power, varying in scale alone. This form is the law of transgression and punishment, with its interplay of licit and illicit. Whether one attributes to it the form of the prince who formulates rights, of the father who forbids, of the censor who enforces silence, or of the master who states the law, in any case one schematizes power in a juridical form, and one defines its effects as obedience. Confronted by a power that is law, the subject who is constituted as subject who is subjected, is he who obeys. To the formal homogeneity of power in these various instances corresponds the general form of submission in the one who is constrained by it, whether the individual in question is the subject opposite the monarch, the citizen opposite the state, the child opposite the parent, or the disciple opposite the master, a legislative power on one side and an obedient subject on the other. Underlying both the general theme that power represses sex and the idea that the law constitutes desire 
one encounters the same putative mechanics of power. It is defined in a strangely restrictive way, in that, to begin with, this power is poor in resources, sparing of its methods, monotonous in the tactics it utilizes, incapable of invention, and seemingly doomed always to repeat itself. Further, it is a power that only has the force of the negative on its side, a power to say no. In no condition to produce, capable only of posting limits, it is basically anti-energy. This is the paradox of its effectiveness. It is incapable of doing anything, except to render what it dominates incapable of doing anything either, except for what this power allows it to do. And finally, it is a power whose model is essentially juridical, centered on nothing more than the statement of the law and the operation of taboos. All the modes of domination, submission, and subjugation are ultimately reduced to an effect of obedience. Why is this juridical notion of power, involving as it does the neglect of everything that makes for its productive effectiveness, its strategic resourcefulness, its positivity, so readily accepted? In a society such as ours, where the devices of power are so numerous, its rituals so visible, and its instruments ultimately so reliable, in this society that has been more imaginative, probably, than any other in creating devious and supple mechanisms of power, what explains this tendency not to recognize the latter except in the negative and emaciated form of prohibition? Why are the deployments of power reduced simply to the procedure of the law of interdiction? Let me offer a general and tactical reason that seems self-evident. Power is tolerable only on condition that it mask a substantial part of itself. Its success is proportional to its ability to hide its own mechanisms. Would power be accepted if it were entirely cynical? For it, secrecy is not in the nature of an abuse. It is indispensable to its operation. Not only because power imposes secrecy on those whom it dominates, but because it is perhaps just as indispensable to the latter. Would they accept it if they did not see it as a mere limit placed on their desire, leaving a measure of freedom, however slight, intact, Power as a pure limit set on freedom is, at least in our society, the general form of its acceptability. There is, perhaps, a historical reason for this. The great institutions of power that developed in the Middle Ages, monarchy, the state with its apparatus, rose up on the basis of a multiplicity of prior powers, and to a certain extent in opposition to them. Dense, entangled, conflicting powers, powers tied to the direct or indirect dominion over the land, to the possession of arms, to serfdom, to bonds of suzerainty and vassalage. If these institutions were able to implant themselves, if, by profiting from a whole series of tactical alliances, they were able to gain acceptance, this was because they presented themselves as agencies of regulation, arbitration and demarcation as a way of introducing order in the midst of these powers, of establishing a principle that would temper them and distribute them according to boundaries and a fixed hierarchy. Faced with a myriad of clashing forces, these great forms of power functioned as a principle of right that transcended all the heterogeneous claims, manifesting the triple distinction of forming a unitary regime, of identifying its will with the law, and of acting through mechanisms of interdiction and sanction. The slogan of this regime, Pax et Justitia, in keeping with the function it laid claim to, established peace as the prohibition of feudal or private wars, and justice as a way of suspending the private settling of lawsuits. Doubtless there was more to this development of great monarchic institutions than a pure and simple juridical edifice. But such was the language of power, the representation it gave of itself, and the entire theory of public law that was constructed in the Middle Ages, or reconstructed from Roman law, bears witness to the fact. Law was not simply a weapon skillfully wielded by monarchs. It was the monarchic system's mode of manifestation and the form of its acceptability. In Western societies since the Middle Ages, the exercise of power has always been formulated in terms of law. A tradition dating back to the 18th or 19th century has accustomed us to place absolute monarchic power on the side of the unlawful. Arbitrariness, abuse, caprice, willfulness, privileges and exceptions, the traditional continuance of accomplished facts. 
But this is to overlook a fundamental historical trait of Western monarchies. They were constructed as systems of law. They expressed themselves through theories of law, and they made their mechanisms of power work in the form of law. The old reproach that de Boulainvilliers directed at the French monarchy, that it used the law and jurists to do away with rights and to bring down the aristocracy, was basically warranted by the facts. Through the development of the monarchy and its institutions, this juridico-political dimension was established. It is by no means adequate to describe the manner in which power was and is exercised, but it is the code according to which power presents itself and prescribes that we conceive of it. The history of the monarchy went hand in hand with the covering up of the facts and procedures of power by juridico-political discourse. Yet despite the efforts that were made to disengage the juridical sphere from the monarchic institution and to free the political form from the juridical, the representation of power remained caught within this system. Consider the two following examples. Criticism of the 18th century monarchic institution in France was not directed against the juridico-monarchic sphere as such, but was made on behalf of a pure and rigorous juridical system to which all the mechanisms of power could conform, with no excesses or irregularities, as opposed to a monarchy which, notwithstanding its own assertions, continuously overstepped the legal framework and set itself above the laws. Political criticism availed itself, therefore, of all the juridical thinking that had accompanied the development of the monarchy, in order to condemn the latter but it did not challenge the principle which held that law had to be the very form of power, and that power always had to be exercised in the form of law. Another type of criticism of political institutions appeared in the 19th century, a much more radical criticism in that it was concerned to show not only that real power escaped the rules of jurisprudence, but that the legal system itself was merely a way of exerting violence, of appropriating that violence for the benefit of the few and of exploiting the dissymmetries and injustices of domination under cover of general law. But this critique of law is still carried out on the assumption that, ideally and by nature, power must be exercised in accordance with a fundamental lawfulness. At bottom, despite the differences in epochs and objectives, the representation of power has remained under the spell of monarchy. In political thought and analysis, we still have not cut off the head of the king. Hence the importance that the theory of power gives to the problem of right and violence, law and illegality, freedom and will, and especially the state and sovereignty, even if the latter is questioned insofar as it is personified in a collective being and no longer a sovereign individual. To conceive of power on the basis of these problems is to conceive of it in terms of a historical form that is characteristic of our societies, the juridical monarchy. Characteristic, yet transitory. For while many of its forms have persisted to the present, it has gradually been penetrated by quite new mechanisms of power that are probably irreducible to the representation of law. As we shall see, these power mechanisms are, at least in part, those that beginning in the 18th century took charge of men's existence, men as living bodies. And if it is true that the juridical system was useful for representing, albeit in a non-exhaustive way, a power that was centered primarily around deduction, prélèvement, and death, it is utterly incongruous with the new methods of power whose operation is not ensured by right but by technique, not by law, but by normalization, not by punishment, but by control, methods that are employed on all levels and in forms that go beyond the state and its apparatus. We have been engaged for centuries in a type of society in which the juridical is increasingly incapable of coding power, of serving as its system of representation. Our historical gradient carries us further and further away from a reign of law that had already begun to recede into the past at a time when the French Revolution and the accompanying age of constitutions and codes seemed to destine it for a future that was at hand. It is this juridical representation that is still at work in recent analyses concerning the relationships of power to sex. But the problem is not to know whether desire is alien to power, whether it is prior to the law, as is often thought to be the case, when it is not rather the law that is perceived as constituting it. This question is beside the point, 
Whether desire is this or that, in any case one continues to conceive of it in relation to a power that is always juridical and discursive, a power that has its central point in the enunciation of the law. One remains attached to a certain image of power law, of power sovereignty, which was traced out by the theoreticians of right and the monarchic institution. It is this image that we must break free of, that is, of the theoretical privilege of law and sovereignty, if we wish to analyse power within the concrete and historical framework of its operation. We must construct an analytics of power that no longer takes law as a model and a code. This history of sexuality, or rather this series of studies concerning the historical relationships of power and the discourse on sex, is, I realize, a circular project in the sense that it involves two endeavors that refer back to one another. We shall try to rid ourselves of a juridical and negative representation of power and cease to conceive of it in terms of law, prohibition, liberty, and sovereignty. But how then do we analyze what has occurred in recent history with regard to this thing, seemingly one of the most forbidden areas of our lives and bodies, that is sex? How, if not by way of prohibition and blockage, does power gain access to it? Through which mechanisms or tactics or devices? But let us assume in turn that a somewhat careful scrutiny will show that power in modern societies has not in fact governed sexuality through law and sovereignty. Let us suppose that historical analysis has revealed the presence of a veritable technology of sex, one that is much more complex and above all much more positive than the mere effect of a defense could be. This being the case, does this example, which can only be considered a privileged one since power seemed in this instance more than anywhere else to function as prohibition, not compel one to discover principles for analyzing power which do not derive from the system of right and the form of law. Hence it is a question of forming a different grid of historical decipherment by starting from a different theory of power, and at the same time of advancing little by little toward a different concept of power through a closer examination of an entire historical material. We must at the same time conceive of sex without the law, and power without the king.